Minh Thúy xin kính chào quý vị hôm nay thứ Sáu, 19 tháng 4, 2024. Đến với VATV hôm nay gồm có phỏng vấn đặc biệt và nhạc lá bồ đề. Kính thưa quý vị, huấn luyện cho các nhân viên Mỹ trước khi gửi họ sang công tác ở Việt Nam là một quá trình quan trọng của chính phủ Mỹ. Những cuộc huấn luyện đó không những chỉ về ngôn ngữ mà còn về văn hóa, xã hội, lịch sử của Việt Nam. Trong phần phỏng vấn kỳ này thì Minh Thúy mời quý vị theo dõi những nhận định của ông Lacey Rice và những giải thích của ông vì sao các nhân viên của Sở Ngoại vụ thường lưu loát tiếng Việt trong khi rất ít cố vấn quân sự lưu loát tiếng Việt. Tuy họ cũng được đào tạo trong những khóa học y hệt như nhau. Sau các cuộc huấn luyện thì họ thường được chỉ định công tác như thế nào? Thi hành công tác ra sao? Tường trình thế nào với thượng cấp? Minh Thúy mời quý vị theo dõi công tác chính của các nhân viên sở ngoại vụ qua các việc làm cụ thể hàng ngày khi họ công tác ở Việt Nam. Trong phần 4 phỏng vấn đặc biệt do Phan Lê Dũng, Võ Thành Nhân và Minh Thúy thực hiện. Back at the question of uh, training, you said that before you came to Vietnam, there was a training period, first to be a, a foreign service, and then uh, later specifically linguistically Vietnamese. Would you say that these uh, training give you enough orientation and uh, enough about Vietnam before you came to Vietnam? You know, when you're in training, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to visualize what you're actually going to be involved in mm -hmm. when you get there. So I think you have to uh, take that into account. On the other hand, the language training was, was superb. Now, the, uh, the, the, or the State Department at that time put on a huge effort to teach people Vietnamese. And uh, there were uh, a number of us from the Foreign Service in that. They were from USAID, uh, probably a few from the CIA, uh, and a number of uh, military officers. Uh, and out of that, some people uh, didn't, did not do well. If they didn't do well, they were sent earlier to Vietnam. So mm -hmm. there was a, that was an extra mm -hmm. added incentive to <laughs> study your lessons. Uh, But uh, I would say that as, you look, as I look back on it and look back upon the people who uh, went there, there were a very large handful of Foreign Service officers and others who really spoke excellent Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I think probably that's something that has uh, slipped below the radar for most people. Mm -hmm. You know, the United States is often Uh, criticized for uh, sending its diplomats into places where they don't speak the language. Uh, I would say by and large that criticism is unfounded. Mm -hmm. I would say that in most countries and certainly in Vietnam, uh, among all of the uh, diplomats of foreign countries who uh, were there, uh, the Americans were number one in speaking the language, certainly mm -hmm. in Vietnam and probably in most places in the world, mm -hmm. because we have a very good language school and uh, the State Department puts a lot of emphasis mm -hmm. on teaching languages. Yeah. What about other aspects like the cultural aspect, the soci uh, societal aspect, like you, when you look to Vietnam, do they give you the view of the country and how you should behave and all that? Yeah, they did all that and they taught us about Tet and they taught us about uh, other uh, kinds of uh, customs uh, mm -hmm. of the Vietnamese. And I, th and I think that the people who probably benefited uh, from that the most were those of us who were sent down to uh, live at the province and, and district levels. Mm -hmm. They were able to uh, see that right away. And by the way, they were the people who, uh, by and large, turned out to be speaking excellent Vietnamese for mm -hmm. very good reason. They were immersed in the language right away. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, the, the military officers among us uh, 
uh, almost none learned to speak Vietnamese. I don't think that's because they were uh, not smart or they didn't try. It was because once they went to Vietnam, immediately they were almost all uh, cast as advisors to uh, Vietnamese officers. So they arrived, they met their counterpart officer. Their counterpart would have spoken some English and they would have kept speaking English all the time they left. Mm -hmm. I can only think, in, in my own experience, I can only think of one American military officer who really spoke Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. there, there were probably more, mm -hmm. but uh, in my experience, only one. Mm -hmm. And how do they assign you once when you graduate from those courses, from the training? Well, uh, they had a list of, naturally, of, of all of the uh, jobs out there and which ones were uh, which ones were coming open. For in, in, in my own, and, and most of the uh, people who went there from my, my class and other classes were put into cords after 1967. That's when cords started, which as you know is what civil operations and mm -hmm. uh, uh, rural development support. Mm -hmm. the, organ, the, the half military, half civilian. So the first time they incorporate the two into one. Yes, to make it uniformly, time. right? And, and so uh, most people went to courts. I did not. I was uh, uh, n nothing to do with me. It's just what I was assigned. Mm -hmm. I was assigned to the U.S. Embassy and to the political section, mm -hmm. and within the political section, to a unit uh, which was called the Provincial Reporting Unit. The political section at that time had. Uh, positions, two positions for each of the four corps. And I was one of the people, one of the two people, who was sent to uh, four corps, the Mekong Delta. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I lived part of the time in uh, Kanta mm -hmm. and uh, part of the time in Saigon, about half and half, really. So, so my job, even though I, I, I was dealing with Cord's people all the time. My job bureaucratically was different. Mm -hmm. And how, how oh, describe to us what your daily uh, duty, normally what you do from day to day. It was very amorphous. Uh, we, our, our overall job was to go out and report back things to the, the embassy that would be of interest, mm -hmm. uh, concentrating because we were civilians concentrating on the political situation. So uh, we had to learn all about the different uh, non-communist mm -hmm. political parties in Vietnam, of which there were a number. Uh, we needed to learn about the Wahao, mm -hmm. uh, about the Cao Dai, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, other uh, the Montagnard mm -hmm. uh, and other uh, political forces in South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we did a, a, a lot of reporting on them. Uh, we reported on the uh, progressive nationalist movement of Professor Bohm, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, in, in, in very, uh, held in very high regard by the embassy, mm -hmm. which saw it as uh, uh, a chance to, uh, uh, as, as a grouping of very attractive people, mm -hmm. uh, teachers, uh, other kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, people who were idealistic, uh, who were non-communist, but also uh, clean, uh, also had uh, very high hopes for the, the advancement of South Vietnam as a country. So uh, that was, uh, uh, that movement was held in very high regard and the embassy followed it very closely. Mm. We mm. had, for example, a man uh, named Dick Thompson mm -hmm. at the, uh, in the embassy political section in Saigon who followed 
Professor Bohm and Nguyen Ngoc Hui around mm. all the time and mm. reported on what they were doing. Mm. So mm. we were, and we were uh, boosters of them. We hoped they would succeed. Kính mời quý vị đón xem phần 5 phỏng vấn với ông Lê Si Rai, nhân viên cao cấp Sở Ngoại vụ, sẽ được phát hình vào tối thứ Sáu, ngày 26 tháng 4, 2024.